So those are the authority sources rejected, verses 12 to 14. What are the authority sources accepted, verses 15 to 18? What then, biblically, are the authentic sources of spiritual authority? Galatians 6, 15 to 18. Paul is not talking down spiritual authority or its exercise. Quite the reverse is true. Now let's get this absolutely clear. The Bible relies on the exercise of authority in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God. Because it is a kingdom, not a coffee morning. At a coffee morning, anyone speaks when they want to. They can say almost anything they like and they behave as they wish when they leave. But it isn't so with God's church because God's kingdom is a kingdom with a king. Not a coffee morning with a host or a compere or an entertainer. Moreover, the Bible, over the Bible teaches Christ's followers to respect the authority of those that Christ has put over us. And our preachers too. We need to be men under the authority of, of others. Our peers and, and, and those that we look to as leading preachers and teachers of the Word of God. We have to do that. Spiritual authority, exercising it and respecting it, are biblically necessary, but it is not a matter of popularity. It's not a matter of, in the popular jargon, influence. But it arises from two things Paul goes on to mention in this passage here. It arises from the fact that it is gospel truth that's being taught, verses 15 and 16, and then it arises from something else in a minute. It derives from the fact that the truth is what is being taught. And here's the truth taught that reinforces Paul's ministry. Truth relevant, though potentially unpopular, in that situation. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. You have a choice. You can boil. Or you can see that this guy is going out on a limb to bring you faithful Bible ministry here. And he's bringing you the truth and you respect him for that. What counts, says Paul, is a new creation. See, Bible truth. I can root that in Jeremiah. And there's grace about his ministry. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. Even to the Israel of God. It's not that he's being angular. He's being gracious, but he's being truthful. It's the central gospel truth that applies to their problem that Paul picks up on and he says, you've got to have this. authenticates his ministry. He looks them straight in the eye and he tells them God's truth. And if their hearts are not right with God, they'll turn on him. Be there, done that. If you throw your pills to pigs, they'll turn around and trample them and you. But his authority lies in the fact that he speaks as God's spokesman, the truth that God once told to them. When he's speaking truth. Not just any truth, but the truth that applies. Truth taught and sacrifice made, verse 17. Firstly, the source of the preacher's authority is the truthfulness of the truth he proclaims and the genuine relevance of it to that situation. Because guys will, guys will be preaching, you know, absolutely true truth, but it's completely irrelevant to the needs of the flock, right? True truth, genuine relevance. Secondly, the source of Paul's spiritual authority is not the size of his church or the scale of his budget, but the sacrifice that he makes for the gospel. Here's the clincher. Paradoxically, those Judaizers were going around circumcising Gentile converts to try to avoid the persecution of the Jews, but it was following the Lord into these persecutions that would have authenticated their service to God. Jesus went into these things. If you're following him, that's where you go. Paul is very clear in his theology of Christian ministerial suffering. It constitutes the authentication of his gospel ministry. Finally, verse 17. Let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Back up. Now, what does he mean by bearing Christ's marks? The marks on Paul's body are described well enough. Marks Christ bore as he walked away at the cross. Whippings and floggings and all the rest of it. Did Paul tell us of the scars? Well, you can read about it 
in 2 Corinthians 6. And if we had more time, we would we'll get to it in a second. So on the basis of Scripture, how does Paul bear in his body the marks of Jesus? He was flogged for the gospel five times. He was beaten with rods three times. And then there was stoning, which nobody should have survived. He must have had scars from that. And shipwrecked and drifting at sea. The guy's got scars on his body for his service of Jesus in a hostile world. And it shows he's the real deal. And that's a source of his spiritual authority. Following Jesus should cost us, and it has clearly cost him. He's authentic. And because he's authentic, he's got spiritual authority. The sacrifice a person makes, it tells you what they believe, and what they're for, and what they're genuine about. Specifically, it's a sacrifice of preacher or a spiritual leader. Well, the preacher is the only sort of spiritual leader recognized in Scripture. It is that sacrifice they make for the shepherd and the sheep that authenticates and authorizes what they do. It is what authenticates our Christian discipleship. Ayut Fernando has got a really good book on this about uh, embracing suffering in your ministry. And uh, I'll refer to it again in a minute. Paul is constantly doing that, spelling out. All who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And then go to 2 Corinthians 6. And in 2 Corinthians 6, 4 to 10, he does something very interesting. He's, he's had to teach very strongly in the Corinthian context as well, you see. And again, there are going to be people there saying, Who is this Paul that you use? <laughs> Stuff like that. You've heard it before. How does Paul authenticate? How do he point to what gives authority to what he said to his ministry? Because he's getting called in question in Corinth. He's got a list of things. As servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. How do servants of God commend themselves? In great endurance. That's funny, isn't it? You'd have thought, in a big congregation, you'd have thought in a long list of books you've written, you'd have thought in terms of the style and the comfort and the, you know, God blessing your ministry. God blesses ministry in ways we, we don't quite understand at the moment in the Western Church. How does he do that? How does he, what is it that commends your ministry, Paul? His list here has got three sections. They're red, they're yellow, and they're green on your wall. Okay. Oh, the green doesn't come out very well in the sunshine, does it? Oh, the red is worse. Oh, that's terrible. Does he have made that? We need curtains drawn or something. Paul lists what commends him. Firstly, he presents nine elements of his sufferings. They're in red, and you can't see them because the sun's shining. Okay? Verses 4 to 5, 2 Corinthians 6. Nine elements that describe his sufferings. Next, he presents nine elements of his personal holiness, there in gold on the wall. His difference, not his identification or his coolness. His difference. 2 Corinthians 6, 6 to 7. And then finally, he lists another nine elements of his suffering, there in light green, verses 8 to 10 of 2 Corinthians 6. So what Paul does in 2 Corinthians 6 to say how his ministry is, is worth listening to and must be taken as authoritative, he lists nine sufferings, nine aspects of his holiness and difference from the world around him, and then nine aspects of his suffering for Christ again. Eighteen kinds of suffering for Christ, nine kinds of holiness. These are the two sorts of things that authenticate and give authority to a Bible preaching ministry and to a Christian leadership. Sufferings. Set of partners for God, difference from the world around, and sufferings. Which bit's he emphasizing? Sufferings. The price he's paid to follow the self-sacrificing Christ. And now, writing to these Galatians, who are being led astray by false teachers, who claimed greater authority than Paul's in order to lead them astray, Paul writes this, Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And just as the, the marks or the stigmata, as they were called, of a slave revealed who owned that slave, the scars that Paul had received from the beatings he'd endured bore witness to his authenticity as the authoritative servant and preacher of the gospel of Christ. Making sense? Here's Ayi Fernando on the subject of where modern evangelicals have gone wrong over this. He says, and this is a guy who, who uh, heads Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka. He has seen a great deal of suffering through the conflicts that have taken place in that country in recent decades. Sadly, he says we blew it by letting passion become an art form, passion preaching, without the foundation of sincerity. We've committed powerful preachers, you could say entertaining preachers, whose lives were not holy 
and who are getting rich from their preaching rather than suffering for the gospel to rise to the position of being prominent public representatives of Christianity. So naturally, people are suspicious of passion today. But burning passion is a characteristic of Bible preaching. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. How can we restore it? One key is to have preachers who have been ignited by the truth of the word through the Holy Spirit and are willing to pay the price of commitment to that is the crucial issue. I was chatting with a non-Christian guy yesterday about how things are going in the church. Being a non-Christian bloke, his, his, his eye was immediately on the bottom line. So we were talking about money. And I told him a story about sitting in a minister's gathering. Have I told you this before? A little while ago. With a young man who was involved in a church planting ministry. And... Uh, He'd been doing really well, and some of the ways that he was doing really well had upset some of the sloppy old elders in the sending church who controlled the purse strings, and they pulled the money. They pulled the money. So he was left there with half his salary, wife and small kids, gone, because of the effective way that he was pursuing his ministry. We sat in that room, we looked around this room, and there were some big names in that room. There were some big ministries in that room. I said to him, listen, how many of these guys do you think would still be doing the job if they weren't getting paid for it? And in a very charitable and generous way, he ventured the suggestion that maybe half of them. I think probably less. And then I had to say to him, are you one of them? Or are you one of us? By which I mean, are you driven by your professional ministry, or are you driven by the call of God? Senior ministry. To the point. Paul is saying, what authenticates my ministry is that I'm prepared to have a beating for it. I'm prepared for trouble, hardship, distress, beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. Not too many of them. In purity, understanding. Ooh, this is going to set you apart. It's going to be odd now. Uh, oddness of purity and understanding, and patience and kindness, and the Holy Spirit and sincere love, and in truthful speech. That's all, isn't it? And in the power of God, the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left. Surely, what we need in our right and left hand is an advertising campaign and a budget. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like that. But they don't authenticate the ministry. Through glory and dishonour, through bad report and good report, can you bear that? Genuine yet being regarded as impostors. Is that just a first century phenomenon? No, regarded as unknown. Dying, yet we live on. Beaten, yet not killed. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, possessing everything. Paul is well aware that what authorises his ministry, his power to his teaching, is the person he's become under the good hand of God. And so his big, scrawly handwriting from the human perspective is what gives this letter to the Galatians its spiritual authority. Specifically, spiritual authority does not arise from a good outward impression or from well-run PR. should not respect or accept such human manipulation as that, if that's what's there. If that's where a preacher's influence solely arises from, it is fleshly, it is of human creation, it is of human origin, it is not of God. True spiritual authority to lead the Church of God arises elsewhere. Firstly, the source of Paul's spiritual authority lies in the truth of the gospel he's taught them. Secondly, the source of Paul's spiritual authority is not the size of his church or the scale of his budget, but the sacrifice that he makes and the pain that he endures for the sake of his service in the gospel. And if you claim to be a Christian but you don't respect spiritual authority when it's based on criteria like those last two, then there really is something that's wrong with you. Wrong with you. And you'll get all you deserve from the ministry that you seek. But sadly, your faithful, truth-driven, self-sacrificing ministers will not deserve what they get from you. Except 
now on board says. Whichever way you resolve the question of whether these Judaizers are my teaching is authoritative, whichever way you resolve that, is a surprising bit. God bless you. Did you see that? He's gone through all that stuff and he said, don't anybody cause me trouble because I bear on my body the mark of Jesus. And then he says, whichever way this works out. God bless you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. For all the reasons he's gone through in this letter, for all the pain and the anguish and the grief, and the... what will actually bless them is law, not grace. And this is a guy whose ministry is driven not by his following, not by the success of his ministry, but by people receiving the grace of God. And don't we want to live a life that's driven by that? Not to be vindicated. Not to have a big hat or a big following or a big car or a big well, okay. Maybe the car be nice. But but you see the point. Driven by this passion that people should see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. Amen.